seated. <clears throat> this morning, as soon as I asked the first group to take a moment and be silent, somebody's cell phone rang. It was absolutely perfect. <laughs> it's like, God's on the phone. Someone get it. We are going to talk about wilderness this morning. That's really the theme of this message. It's a big part of what we're doing in Advent. Um, the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or arrival. It's this season between now and Christmas, between the 1st of December until Christmas Eve, where in the midst of a really busy place, where all kinds of things are being demanded of you, and all sorts of things are inserting themselves into your day planner, the church is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying, slow down, slow down, and carve out some space to hear that whisper from God. Carve out some room in your life to hear the Holy Spirit speak something to you that will change you in an instant. And oftentimes, that means you've got to get away from the hustle and bustle and traffic of the city. And I'm talking about the city of your heart. And get out into the wilderness. Get away from it. And put yourself in the path of God. It's from there that he speaks. I want to look at our gospel passage this morning. Matthew, if you've got it in your bulletin, you're going to see a repeated theme in this passage. And it's that theme of wilderness. If you've got your Bibles, Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 is where we're beginning. It's this incredible passage from John the Baptist at the beginning of Jesus' earthly, earthly ministry, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist appeared... Where was he? In the wilderness. Oh, you got to hold on to that. See, in the first century world, especially in the ancient Near East, everybody was a city dweller. That's where the walls were. That's where the protection and safety was. And if you're looking for a Messiah, an anointed one, somebody to make Israel great again, he's coming from inside the walls of those cities. The Messiah surely will begin to whisper his voice to Jerusalem from city center. And, and look at how Matthew's gospel starts. That's not the first place that humanity hears the whisper of God. It's outside of the city, in a quiet place, in a still place, where through John the Baptist, God is saying, come on, dude. You want to meet me? Do that. You, you want to know who I am? You want to hear my voice? You're not going to hear it in the middle of the hustle and bustle of that city. Come out into the wilderness and see who I am. Same still true for us. And, and, and that, that's what I want you to hear this morning. That I know one of the things that God is doing with you and with me, this Advent seeing, is, season, is saying, Hey man, hey woman, create some wilderness space and expect to meet me there. Create some wilderness space in your life. You don't have to wander off into the woods to do it. In fact, I would not suggest you do that in Central Florida. It's a dangerous woods. But even if it's on the, on the comfort of your couch and in your living room, create some mental space to come out and be with me. Verse 3, this is the one of whom the prophets Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out, where? In the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. And make his path straight. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit for you this morning. God is saying, hey, will you prepare the way of the Lord in your heart? And, and will you intentionally purpose to make a straight path between your heart and the heart of God? And the way you're going to do that is, dear goodness, you got to put this down. And you got to put the computer down and anything that's got an apple on it. Or those three words, IBM. Did you know 10 or 15 years ago I heard a rumor that IBM was trying to put their logo in outer space so that in the middle of the night you could see it go across the solar stratosphere? I'm like, oh, thank God that didn't happen. I already can't get away from my devices. I don't want to see it looking up the stars at night. You got to get away from this stuff. And you got to carve out some wilderness space because it's there that you'll meet God. It's always been that way. And always will be. I, I, in a former life... I used to really enjoy wilderness. 
Uh, as some of you who know me know, I, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, near Asheville. I spent 18 years within 30 miles of downtown Asheville, and I would intentionally get away. In fact, I would do it for certain reasons, and this might shock you too. I used to be really afraid of the dark. I mean, like, terrified of the dark. I was also scared of elevators. I would not ride elevators. All through my junior high years, I, I, mean, I remember going to UNC Charlotte as a little kid to do a, a research paper that needed to get me to the ninth floor of the library at UNC Charlotte, and I walked the entire flight of steps all the way to the ninth floor and back down. I just wouldn't ride elevators, and I would not go out in the woods at night. I was afraid of the dark. So in college, I would intentionally sojourn for weekend backpacking trips into the Smokies by myself, trying to cure my fear of the dark. And I, this is a true story. I remember one night I was at the top of Mount Lacan, which is the highest mountain, well, it's the second... Second highest mountain in the park, third highest mountain on the east coast, over 6,000 feet high. And I was totally by myself, top of this mountain in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter, it's freezing and pitch black, and I'm in a little shelter that they have all along the Appalachian Trail and all sorts of places in the park. It's a three-walled structure with no front door, completely open to whatever might want to come in and munch you <laughs> in the middle of the night. And I'm, I'm there all by myself, miles from anyone else, on purpose to try and cure my fear of the dark. And I wake up in the middle of the night to this. <laughs> I'm like, I'm too young to die. <laughs> Seriously. And it just got louder and louder. <laughs> it's, like, it's like 20 yards out in front of the shelter. I'm like, oh my Lord, what is that? It's big. You know, I've been watching too many movies of Sasquatch. And I get my flashlight out. And I don't want to shine my light straight at it because I figure it'll charge me if I do that. So I put my hand over the flashlight. Have you ever done this? And you kind of like spread your fingers apart just to get a little light. Well, it didn't work. I'm like shining out in the woods. I don't see anything. So I'm like, all right, we're going full beam. So I just go like this. And thank God, it was just two really huge buck deer. And I was just in their field. That's all it was. Two beautiful buck deer. Scared me to death. But that's why I was there. I was in the wilderness. To change. I, I did it over and over again, all throughout my four years in college. This is a completely true story. God, in fact, did cure my fear of the dark, and he did it in the woods. I was out camping out in Smoky Mountain National Park, and the Lord, I'm sitting there freaked out in the middle of the night, scared to death, and God instantly just deposits in my mind a verse from Psalm 139. Some of you know it. Even darkness is as light to you, O Lord. For even the darkness of night is as bright as the noonday to you, O Lord. God just gave me that verse. I'd read it so many times, and he just popped it into my mind. And instantly, not for real, because that would be spooky, but in my heart, the woods just lit up. And, and I began to think about the fact that as dark as those woods were, they were absolutely like noonday brightness to God, and the fear just went away. Changed. Forever. I am not afraid of the dark. And, and, and here's why. Because in a place of wilderness, God changed my heart. In, in a place of retreat, away from the hustle and bustle of city and busy, God spoke in a whisper. And, and I want you to take that seriously. And I want you to live, leave out of here this morning purposing in your heart to carve out places of wilderness, expecting to meet God there. If you know anything about Israel's story, you know that God's always spoken to them in wilderness. I'm not going to turn there, but if you look at your first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, do you know that four out of those first five books take place in a wilderness? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all entirely take place in a wilderness. It's the story of the Israelites. Remember who they moved to Egypt with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they became enslaved there. Remember the story? And in the book of Exodus chapter 3, what happens? God brings them out into a wilderness. And they spend years sojourning in the middle of the woods following a p pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night. Why? So that they would learn who God was. You see, because everything about them was Egyptian. I mean, think about that. 
I mean, Moses is the first one to come out, if you know your story. Exodus chapter 3, Moses comes out of Egypt first. And he's Egyptian in every way. He talks Egyptian, he eats Egyptian, he sings Egyptian, he worships Egyptian. Everything about his life was Egyptian. And all of a sudden, he's out in the woods, and God starts encountering him and taking the Egypt out of him now that he's out of Egypt. You following me? How? This thing's driving me nuts. I officially declare. Hold on. See, it's supposed to be taped to my beard, but it's... All right, there we go. How's God going to get the 21st century American out of you? And that's not all good, by the way. I'm glad to live in America in the 21st century. But there are some parts of this culture that are not good. And there are some parts of our day and rhythm and life and schedule and agenda and priorities that are not good. And how's God going to call that out of you if you don't separate yourself from it enough to hear his whisper and his opportunity of otherness and differentness of life? And that happens as you intentionally create wilderness spaces. That only happens that way. And the Israelites, they, they come out of Egypt and they know nothing about what that God is that's burning up their cattle when they get too close to it at Mount Sinai. I mean, if you've read the story, Exodus chapter 3 through 18, the entire nation of Israel, they come out of Egypt and they're wandering around following this pillar of fire by cloud that's speaking to them from rumbling thunder. And every time their cattle and animals get too close to it, they get fried. And they don't know who that God is. Their gods were Egyptian gods. You should know that because they built one, a golden calf, in Exodus chapter 40. They weren't even creative about it, chapter 34. Everything they knew was Egyptian. And all of a sudden, they're in the middle of the woods. Why? Because God had to bring them to that place so that they get away from that stuff long enough to be reformed. In every way. And that's what God wants to do with you. That's, that's what he must do with you. If you're going to be the people he's calling you to be. And he's already called you out of your Egypt. I mean, think about the story of your own life. It is in fact an Exodus story. God's called you out of an old and formal life. And old and formal ways. Anyone here been baptized? Yeah? You know what that was? That was your Red Sea crossing. I mean, think about the imagery. The Israelites come out of Egypt and they go through the waters of the Red Sea and their pathway back to their old life is literally shut for them with no bridge. The bridges are burned. They could not go back to Egypt even if they wanted to. They'd have to swim. And God does that intentionally and he does it for you too. He's brought you out of your old life. He's literally shut that way off for you even though you long for it sometimes. And he's calling you now into a wilderness place where you'll push your oldness away and embrace his newness. If you go to Matthew's Gospel and you read the first verse of chapter 4, you'll still see this, that Jesus comes to the Jordan to be baptized by John, and then what's the first thing he does next? He goes into the wilderness. Even the person of God in Jesus Christ has to, at the beginning of his ministry, get out away from it and say, God, help me. Give me your perspective. Make me who you're calling me to be as I head towards the life you're asking me to live. Wilderness place. That's really all I want to say to you this morning. I want to advocate this advent that you create some wilderness. And, and I promise you, you will meet God there. I mean, if you've seen any of our publications, anything that this church has, there are three words that you're usually going to see. Know, experience, and share. And, and one of the things I want you to do is I want you to know God. I want you to know who he is up here. But there's a big difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. And I don't just want you to know facts about God. I want you to experience those facts in every area of your life. I want you to experience the joy of his presence daily. And how is that going to happen if you don't create some space to hear him whisper to you? Um, Sunday's not enough. I mean, I know I'm pretty awesome, and this is pretty awesome. Yeah. 
Don't laugh, Bob. But Sunday's not enough. I mean, this is great what we're doing here. We're coming together as a body of Christ to give God the worship that he's due. You know what? This isn't about you. This is actually a gift to God, what you're doing this morning. Did you know that? That you're here this morning to give God something that he can't have any other way? It's not just about coming to receive something from him. It's you're literally taking your place in the throngs of saints of old who've come and given a gift to God that he couldn't receive any other way than the gathered of his people who declare his name. That's awesome. But that's not the essence of your Christianity. It, that, that's, just a, that's just a part of this relationship that God wants to cultivate in your life seven days a week. And it happens as you push the busyness aside and give yourself some wilderness moments. I want to make one more point. Sometimes God takes us to a wilderness a different way. Not in a joy, but as a discipline. Has anyone ever experienced that? I mean, has anyone ever experienced this, this moment that we're going to see in Isaiah's passage here in just a second, where God takes this homeland that he's given you, and for the Israelites it's the promised land, and through your own rejection of him and pushing him aside week after week, day after day, month after month, your own beautiful promised land turns into a wilderness, a desolate place. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone have some burned out ruins of their own rejection of God? Yeah, sometimes we find ourselves in a wilderness place because of our own poor choices. Well, here's the beautiful hope of Advent, that it's in those broken places that the first light of the hope of the coming of Jesus will be realized in your life. It's in the very midst of that brokenness that God can whisper. And I want to look at this Isaiah 11 passage. It's so beautiful. If you got your bulletins. Isaiah goes like this. Israel is in a really, really bad way. And they're reaping the results of decades of rejection of Yahweh. And by Isaiah chapter 10, the Assyrian army has become, come down and begun to oppress the Israelites from the north. And here's how that looks. It looks like the kings of the Assyria and their armies hacking down the beautiful trees of the Lebanon and taking that wood and turning it into siege works to destroy the cities in Jerusalem and Judea. You following me? So the picture in Isaiah chapter 10 that leads up to our reading in chapter 11 are all the beautiful forests of Lebanon being hacked down so that those trees that God gave Israel as a gift might be used against them as a weapon of war. It's a total depraved picture of the beautiful promised land that God gave Israel turning into a wilderness of desolation because their own rejection of God. It was never on God's heart that the Assyrian army would come in and do this to Israel. And I know, because I've been there myself, that there are times in our lives where through our own poor choices, we find ourselves in a wilderness place of desolation. And we experience the hacking down of things precious to us, and the destroying of things that were ultimately and primarily given as a gift. Well, here's the good news of Advent. Look what happens to those stumps of desolation in our lives. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse. This is the first vision of the Messiah that Isaiah gets in chapter 11. Is He's this little hope, a sprig of of wonderful glory that comes up from one of those broken and cut down stumps because of Israel's rejection of Yahweh. And the shoot is a person. A branch shall grow out from his roots. Verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. Verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt around his waste. You see the picture? From the places of brokenness, from that very place, God brings the first light of the hope of his Messiah. And look at the result, verse 6. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. 
the calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. This is the last thing I want to say to you and I'm going to get out of your way. That I know there are some of you in here who've experienced a little bit of desolation because of your own rejection of God. Well, here's the good news. You do not have a God who is angry at you, who rejects you because of your rejection of him. You have a God who pursues you with his faithful love towards unfaithful people and says, if you will listen to my whisper and turn and repent, I'll bring new life out of the stumps of your brokenness. And that will happen through the person of Jesus. If you'll turn your heart to the risen Savior, God, in fact, heals you right starting with the, your very most broken places. That's the first place you see the glorious light of his dawn. That's the hope of Advent. So, I would just encourage you, this Advent, to make some space for Jesus. Would you? Would you carve out a wilderness space in your life and in your heart? Would you just purpose? I mean, I, I learned years ago to do this thing. Um, my friend Brett Ray taught me to do it. It's called a take five, where I literally just take five minutes of silence and stillness. And just listen. Will you consider some practice like that this Advent? Just put away the cell phone, turn down the noise, turn off the silence. Be still and know that I'm God. Please stand. Service is going to continue with the prayers of the people.